40th birthday rather than merely bore my friends by having anything as mundane as a midlife crisis. I decided it might be more interesting to actually terrify them by going completely mad and declaring myself to be a magician. Comic book creators, particularly British ones for whatever reason, seem to have a peculiar tendency to end up entangled with magic. Alan Moore has become a ritual magician in his own mind and is coming out with the Moon and Serpent Bumper Book of Magic. Grant Morrison, a well-known coyote, the chaos magician, claimed that some of his works were magical workings and where more is more rooted in the more cocky and psychedelic and weed sort of tradition Morrison's much more stemming from the kind of dance rave culture MDMA though they share LSD in common but his is a more modern cooler spin I guess Pat Mills has had a neo-pagan tinge or a historical pagan tinge to everything pretty much that he's done one way or another. It's been extremely informative of his work, characters that he's created like Slane and Finn who are essentially the same character just in different periods of history. Old British comics like Misty which was a girls comic uh, like our main anthology comic 2000 AD have been full of these kind of occult references and ideas and not just for the sake of horror. Maybe this is a peculiarity of the psychogeography of Britain. Maybe it's a peculiarity of the mimetic nature of comics combining images and language in a way that we now call a meme. One need only look to the world of pop art to see how extracted comic images became memes and whole styles springing off that controversially. Even Warren Ellis, who is a much more cynical and grounded British comic book writer, has had his interests in the occult, in biofeedback, in NLP, in nootropics and transhumanism, and all of them, in part, approach the occult as language. I grew up steeped in a lot of this. I read 2000 AD since I was very young. I live in the countryside. I'm surrounded by pagan monuments, Iron Age hill forts, you know, old woods. There's a Roman road running through the village and just digging around in the dirt at my primary school we found old Roman coins. I'm surrounded by history, I've been steeped in the occult, and Britain has never, at least in rural areas, really quite cottoned to Christianity. We just kind of veneer Christianity over the top of old pagan rituals and pretend that this is all somehow to do with the Bible. But I grew up steeped in all this and fascinated by fantasy uh, by art, by comics, by science fiction, by magic, reading Moore's early work, reading some of Morrison's early work, Ellis's early work. I had a friend who was obsessed with the occult, uh, Satanism and ritual magic and all the rest of it. I read some of the things that he had. I wanted magic to be real. I wanted some kind of religion, perhaps, to be real for there to be some power to appeal to or some way to work my will directly upon the world without having to actually work at it. <laughs> I wanted ghosts to be real. Plenty of ghost stories around here, you know, psychic powers, some kind of spirituality, whatever that word even means. I, I wanted to be true, but it wasn't and it never would be, and I spent a huge part of my teens and twenties yeah, fairly exhaustively trying to find anything that rang true. Halting experiments with psychedelics bore no particular fruit. I seem to have peculiar brain chemistry, even when it comes to legal drugs. 
Will working produced nothing. Ritual grimoires were interesting, but the sigils and signs and the rituals did nothing. None of it really gelled with me, even though our culture's steeped in it. Faust, Shakespeare, um, our history, Matthew Hopkins, witch hunting, all kinds of manners of traditions and that, and that occult underlying pagan root to so much around us. It's all there, but none of this gelled. Chaos magic later on was the most interesting, though I'd already started down the more uh, sceptomantic <laughs> path by then. So the idea of chaos magic was that it was individuated. It was a kind of buffet occultism. And the idea was that you use whatever works and you use whatever works for you. And that was more interesting and appealed to my increasingly sceptical frame of mind. But again, the experiments really amounted to nothing other than an excuse to jerk off <laughs> more than usual, perhaps. None of it worked. So I set all of that stuff aside and I have been extremely dismissive with good reason of religion and spirituality and the occult ever since. What these um, pop culture magicians seem to want to do is to rehabilitate magic to put the most positive historical spin possible onto what magic even means hence the attempts to redefine it as meaning language and they, they're trying to extract something useful from it and to add layers of meaning and magical traditions religious traditions ideological traditions are all full of symbols and meaning which makes it a, a rich vein to tap for stories folklore horror stories science fiction fantasy Tolkien's great work was lifted a great deal <laughs> from the Kalevala. The uh, Finno-Ugric uh, religious mythology, along with other bits and pieces that he half-inched from here and there and everywhere else. Moore has a deep understanding of historical context. He's very exacting, he's very obsessive. And so his work is full of layered nuance that a lot of people simply aren't going to get, even well-read people. <laughs> you have to kind of collectivize to extract all the meaning from Moore's work. And unlike a lot of authors or a lot of artists, that meaning is genuinely deliberately placed there. If you've ever read any of his raw scripts for comics, you, you know, that rapidly becomes obvious. Whereas in a lot of other cases, in trying to read something into what an author has created, you're making it up. Moore is trying to tug at our strings and trying to have in increasingly an effect on the real world to do things to demonstrate that his point of view is correct. Whether it is or not remains to be seen. He was wrong, as most prophets are, about the end of the world. But I think his tongue was well in his cheek there. Morrison seems to be much more engaged in the modern views of magic, the chaos magic. You can see in his great work, The Invisibles, how he sought to modernize, to tap into that rich undercurrent of conspiracy culture and so on. And unfortunately, recent events have only added fuel to that fire with Epstein and similar. But it's a trope, this idea of this occult conspiracy behind everything that you find, again, going back into history, he's just modernized it. And we also see it in things like Alex Jones and the kind of mimetic way in which he approaches it. He's presenting conspiracy theories, but he's presenting them in a newsroom. He's using language to try and be more persuasive and outrage and emotion, which tugs at particular strings of our psychology as well. Mills tries to rehabilitate it by tying it into our history and our cultural identity as Britons, 
which isn't something that particularly <laughs> exists. We're a Mongol race, we always have been. Celts, Picts, Angles, Saxons, Romans, <sighs> Normans. Uh, then we've brought in the Windrush and uh, the Indian and Pakistani diaspora as well. And all of these communities have become part of Britain's rich tapestry. And I think this pluralism, this multiculturalism, though we've not always been terribly good at it, uh, is responsible for what greatness remains in Britain and what made it great back in the day. And that seems to be something that holds true through a lot of history, but which runs counter to the ideas of a lot of uh, right-wing nationalists and so on. And I express this as it's the memes, not the genes. And what Mills is trying to do, I think, in his work is to preserve the pagan substrate to British culture to make us all more aware of it. I don't know if he's consciously doing this, maybe it's just a rich source of stories for him. But certainly living in the landscape that, that we do in Britain and reading Mills's work, there's a connection there. It contextualizes it, it, it sits you in it. And as the stories of Slain have moved on through British history and so on, that's become even more graspable, I think. Ellis tends to take this view to an extreme, this rehabilitation, by turning magic into something else, the kind of thing that Moore is hinting at, that Morrison is obfuscating. His work has tapped into transhumanism, uh, nootropics, biofeedback, um, neurolinguistic programming. A lot of this stuff is pseudo-scientific or at best semi-scientific but you can see that same kind of theme being tapped into there. Uh, Jordan Peterson in his somewhat disingenuous attempts to rehabilitate religion touches on the same thing the maps of meaning the context and power of symbols and language He's using it, I think, for bad purposes in trying to rehabilitate the concept of God, the ultimate authoritarian. This is his attempt to impose order, I suppose, which can be viewed as a magical working in and of itself. And he certainly tapped into an undercurrent of insecurity, which is what I think panics people about him. Self-help can be good. My concern is that he doesn't have this modernist, syncretic approach to the psychology of magic and spirituality, again, whatever that means, that these other figures do. But he is coming at it from the psychological tradition, which is where I think we might start to get a grasp on some of this, even though psychology is rapidly being outmoded by neurobiology. So what the common thread is between all of these, whether they are self-admittedly talking about magic or not, is magic as language, as description, as abstraction, as a cultural memory, um, a means of influencing the mind, which in turn influences actions and through actions influences the world. Changes in state of perception, like drugs, but accomplished through magic. The, the bardic tradition, the skaldic tradition. And I think the idea of meme magic also taps into this. Memes, as we've come to understand them, not what they originally meant, but they're a combination of an image and language that conveys a huge amount of information in a relatively small amount of space. Now, they say a picture you know, tells a thousand words, but the addition of text contextualizes that image meaning, changes it, solidifies it to an extent. So it's a highly effective packaged way of presenting information and perhaps changing psychology, ideas, and so on. Which is why we now see the, the ridiculous spectacle of political campaigns, both here in the UK and in the US, 
trying to harness the power of memes. But memes, like animals, are most powerful and strongest when they occur in the wild, naturally. These hothouse memes, these engineered memes, that these political groups are trying to create simply cannot stand up to the the strength and the vigour that these wild memes have. So I think it's largely a doomed enterprise in the way that it wasn't back in the days of propaganda because the tools of communication are now in everyone's hands. It's a wild mimetic jungle out there. You might want some evidence of some of these kind of things and um, I'm going to appeal to your personal experience and interactions with reality. Consider the power of titles and what you call someone. It's power in a name. If my name was Tarquin, you might have a very different reaction to me and everything that I say. You would make certain assumptions about class and wealth and so on that you're probably already making because of my accent <laughs> inappropriately. But we also see this in work titles. Call someone a janitor or a caretaker and it conjures a particular image, not necessarily a particularly good one. Or toilet cleaner, for example, you're likely to look down your nose at someone who might be that. But the moment you call them an environmental maintenance engineer or a sanitation engineer, something like that, a sanitation manager that somehow conveys a different meaning, even though we all know, I think, if we pause to think for a moment, that it's the same thing. And this is the same that we see with political correctness. I usually hark back to the same, uh, <laughs> the same few examples, um, the politicised language during the Vietnam War, you know, where an, an ambush became a preemptive counterattack. It's all about spin, it's all about changing the impression simply by describing the same event, the same thing in a different way. And this is also why I think, similarly to the wild versus hothouse memes, why it is that attempts to police and control language tend to fail. Language evolves naturally. People use it in the way that they're going to use it. If you try to stop someone from saying retarded and instead have them say mentally subnormal or, or differently abled or something like that, all that happens is the, the new term becomes the insult. There's the famous Blue Peter example that I've referenced before when perfectly well-meaning, they, they brought on this disabled guy to uh, be an example to the kids of how they're real people and we should treat them nicely and all the rest of it, and all that happened was that the poor man's name uh, became the new insult. You're a Joey instead of you're a spastic. And uh, spastic has a rich history of being back and forth as being an insult or a proper, proper medical term. Yeah. I can call myself a writer and a game designer, but language has nuance. Right? I could also tell you that I'm a, a content provider. That would be accurate, but it's quite clinical. I don't think it describes well <laughs> what I do. It's it's quite meaningless in a lot of ways. And it's, it's crass and commercialized. I could describe myself as an entertainer. I could say that I lie professionally for money, even though I'm not in marketing. <laughs> I could say that I am a, a magician who conjures worlds and group hallucinations that we can share. Yeah, I, I could invoke the traditions of bards or of scalds, uh, shamans. Yeah, it all depends on what kind of impression I want to make and how I feel about what I do. And I think this part of this attempt to rehabilitate magic and to redefine it as language and why this is occurring in the artistic and, and writing communities and particularly the intersection of writing and art that we, that we find in comics. In part, I think it's um, self-aggrandizement. 
wanting to make what we do as entertainers, as, as writers, as artists more meaningful than perhaps it necessarily is. But there's a kernel of truth to it all. The English language in particular has the most, as far as I'm aware, I, I tried to research again, but I've somehow picked up this nugget of information, that the English language has more descriptive adjectives than any other modern language. It was a dark and stormy night. It was a dim and squally night. It was a tenebrous and tempestuous night. Word choice, inflection, these all conjure slightly different images and emotions. It's a subtle difference in the, in the mind of the listener. Your selection of words, the extra meaning that they carry beyond their bold description, it, it all has an effect. And words aren't the only form. Uh, visual media, art, music, clothing, choosing to wear a particular thing or to have uh, particular symbols on you, whether you're doing it just to trigger conspiracy theorists like I do or to take on a sense of authority. A white lab coat lends a certain almost ritualized authenticity to what you're saying to certain people. You're taking on the, the mantle of science, of the scientist, in a way that putting on a mask or a particular ritual get-up in the past may have had you take on the mantle of a shaman. You know, it lends you authority. It makes you seem more credible because it becomes associated with that tradition of getting into reality. To certain other people, of course, that's a, that's a red flag. It's a warning sign. So you have to know your audience and what you're communicating to them. Some people react badly to scientific medicine or scientific claims, but they will react positively to someone in a priest's collar or uh, with a Himalayan pink salt lamp behind them on a shelf or something. To, to others, that will lend them credibility that the scientist won't have, which is unfortunate. <laughs> But both of these things can lend a convincing air to medical claims to different sorts of people. Just as Alex Jones dressing up as a newscaster doesn't make him a newscaster, but it lends him some of that authority. He's dressing up as a thing, he's having a resonance with a thing to take some of its power in a way. Of course, none of this is real still in any meaningful sense. All of these things, these impressions and so on, they're limited unless someone acts to the mind. It's not like this has to be bullshit. You can convey accurate or useful information linguistically or representatively. A recipe, uh, a formula, um, a painting on the cave wall to show where the good hunting grounds are, the process or procedure for doing this, that or the other. Memes can be useful deleterious or neutral and like selfish genes they can use organisms in order to propagate themselves some of the most toxic mimetic organisms or meme plexes as they should properly be called are ideologies or religions especially those ones which brook no doubt and no compromise i think we can see that in history in terms of Christianity, as was, until it was beaten into submission, Islam now, communism, or more accurately, Marxism, or fascism. These are memes that are deleterious both to the individual organism, to the collective communal organism of humanity, but they perpetuate anyway. They, they use us. Moore and his contemporaries are trying to rehabilitate magic and spirituality by redefining it. A fallacy of redefinition to encompass the genuine psychological effects that language in its broadest sense and information in its broadest sense can have upon us. And we use these kind of tricks in therapy for mental health to try and fix our broken brains. We use mimetic techniques like cognitive behavioral therapy and, and so on to try and fix these, these ruptures and broken parts of our minds. We also use mimetic techniques, or rather perhaps the memes use us, <laughs> uh, 
as a vector to infect others with ideologies and religions, political points of view, whatever else it might be. Again, some of these are good, some of these are bad, some of these are indifferent. Which way round to wear your baseball cap this season is indifferent. Um, killing people for falling in love with someone of the same sex, that's bad. Yeah, and then there's good information like how to make cake. But we could use all of these tools in a more positive way, I think. I mean, we use physical technology to make ourselves fly, to drive, to travel at high speed, to communicate at great distances and across time as well as space, as I am now, to store and preserve things for long periods. You know, we're not content with simply maintaining the status quo when it comes to physical technology. Chemically, pharmaceuticals are used to heal the body, but people also experiment with substances to make themselves more than they already are, to make them better, to inspire them, to trigger the creative process, to give them focus, to let them work through the night even if it's just coffee, right? You're using that to improve upon the natural organism. The transhumanist drive to better and to improve the human organism has been fixated upon technological means, transitioning and transforming the body and brain to a physically transhuman and post-human state. Of course, all brains are physical. There's no such thing as a soul, in my opinion. I'm making a, a brain-body divide just for sake of argument here. So what if we could use these psychological healing techniques, these informational techniques, these marketing techniques, mimetic techniques, not just to restore our mental health or to try and infect people with memes that we think that they should be infected with or that the memes think that people should be infected with, but what if we could use these techniques to actually improve the mind, to change ourselves, to make ourselves better? What if we could use cognitive behaviour therapy not to return us to a state of equilibrium, but to improve upon where we were before, to train ourselves to be different people? What if we could adopt fiction suits to act as the person we want to be until we are that person? These are interesting ideas I think that we'd have to tread very carefully but what if we could craft deliberately positive meme plexes like religions like ideologies without that flaw that that ultimate problem of insisting that you absolutely must be right and nothing can ever change to the point where even things like the US Constitution is held to be like scripture unchangeable when it was always designed to be changed and that was its genius so if we reject the idea that any of this is true, but just try to extract the useful parts, which is what I've been trying to clumsily do, then maybe we might be onto something and maybe we can improve our emotions, our mentality, our essential being in a way that we do our technology, perhaps. So what might this look like in practice? There's a thing Christians do, you know, what would Jesus do? And that's an exercise I think we could all adopt and take on. The idea of what am I about to do and what would this heroic or mythological or idealized figure do in that situation and can I do that? You know, it doesn't have to be Jesus, you could substitute Hercules or Thor or whoever else you wanted into that space and think how would they act you could even construct one whole cloth or take a take a character from fiction and use them as your guide even even role play as them as you go through your day-to-day -day life and that can help train you towards a particular mode of being that you aspire to behavior thought emotional reactions to things the other day i was out driving to pick up my partner from the station, like I always do. And there was a crash on the road. And the driving makes me anxious at the best of times. It really triggers my anxiety. I don't like it at all. I don't like being in charge of this heavy hunk of machinery moving at tens of miles an hour. 
So I had a little mini sort of panic attack because this was my regular route that I take into town and I couldn't take it. And if my routine gets disrupted while I'm driving, that's when it's particularly stressful. So I turned around, went back down the road, pulled over and I called my mother, which is what you do <laughs> when you're having a stressful time. And I got directions from her for another way to get into town. We didn't speak in terms of road names or numbers. Instead, we spoke in terms of our mutual psychogeographical points of reference, you know, things that have happened in particular places, people that live or used to live in particular houses, that sort of thing, which route the trucks take, you know, where I burst my tyre that time, things like that. And that made it easier to remember and I was able to figure out where I was, where I needed to be, through that kind of mutual parochial language that we had between ourselves. And that kind of thing is easier to remember than names and numbers. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's the way mnemonics work, right? You remember a phrase or a rhyme, something that's much bigger than perhaps the single thing that you're trying to remember. It seems like an unwieldy way to organize information, but it works. And it's a real key turner when it comes to trying to learn languages, to take the word from the other language and construct a phrase that relates it to the word in your native language. It makes it a lot easier to remember. It's very, very strange. It's a very weird way of, of organizing things, like a like a mind palace as well. I'm not so sure they uh, actually work. But can we do this artificially? Can we create an artificial psychogeography as a way of remembering things or paths or locations or places that we need to get to? Can I just invent a story or a mythology around it to help me remember? I probably can, I don't particularly need to in the area in which I live, I've lived here most of my life, so everything is layered with emotion and memory and associations and so on, so around here it's quite easy for me. But I don't think there's anything to stop you creating uh, an imaginary story, an imaginary mythology about the geography around where you live and how things relate and interact with one another. You know, none of this has to be true, none of it has to be real. And it's usually when we start treating these things as unassailable truth that we start running into problems. And that's where the metamagical ideas, the meta-language ideas that we see from, from Morris and Moore and the, the semi-scientific fascinations of Ellis, that's where they start to come in, along with this historical cultural theology that the likes of Mills has. And again, it's, it's weird that it's comics creators that seem to really latch on to this, and British comics creators in particular. You know, placebos work a bit, and they don't have any real medical value, just the, the idea that they're working can help relieve a headache or reduce symptoms very slightly. And they work to an extent, even when you know that they're placebos. Nocebos also have an effect, a negative effect. If you tell someone you've poisoned them, they will experience certain ill effects. So given that, it doesn't lend any credibility to real magic, whatever you want to call that. But it does show that there, even though something is not real, it can have an effect on our psychology and our perceptions and our interactions with the reality around us. And as that translates into action, that's where things take place. Like psychological assistance, I think this needs to be extremely tailored to the individual. We're all individuals with different res resonances, different meanings, different life experiences, different memories, different psychological ticks and triggers, even if we share an underlying culture, an underlying context. So what I'm trying to do in that series I just recently started, I hope to get back to, as I can hopefully start making videos again, is to examine these um, spiritual and magical and so on traditions and to find and extract the useful parts from their mimetic code without carrying the negatives with it. Uh, a crisper for psychology and theology, if you will. Should be interesting. Um, these ideas have probably been investigated by other people in the past, but uh, it's all new to me. Sang.